encourage you to open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter, well, we're going to be in chapters 1 and 2 primarily, but as we uh, continue on in our Out of Context series tonight, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We know that there's a lot of different ideas that exist in the world especially in the realm of what would be considered Christianity, concerning what a person needs to do to be saved, a lot of people would conclude that baptism is not necessary as part of the equation to become a child of God, to be cleansed of our sins. And these couple of verses here are at least one of the passages that they would often go to to try and support that position. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it reads, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So here, as this uh, short passage is emphasizing the gift of God, the unmerited favor of God, it also talks about how that Nothing we have done or could do allows us to be saved. And that's certainly correct. And we're going to talk about that and what that really means. But should we conclude, after reading those verses, that, well, baptism, for example, should we classify that as a work that would be one in which we would be trying to merit something from God and thus cannot possibly be part of our salvation, our obedience to Christ? Well, to answer that, as we, as is our custom at this point, we're going to start off by looking at the immediate context of these two verses and kind of zoom out a little bit to make sure we can understand uh, the proper way to understand the ideas put forth here. So depending on the verse or verses that have been the subject of our focus over the course of this series, we've zoomed out, you know, back to the beginning of the chapter. Uh, just depending on what we're looking at, we've zoomed out a little bit or a lot. I think that... Uh, Maybe this week is going to be our furthest zoom out <laughs> of, of all of them. But I, I think that as we consider all of these things, that you'll understand the reason for which I'm choosing to do that. So we're actually going to go all the way back into chapter 1 and start at verse 15 there. And then we'll read down through into chapter 2 and we'll stop at uh, verse 22. So, a little bit of a, a longer reading here, but again, as we begin to make some points, I think you understand why I chose to zoom out as far as, as we've uh, chosen to do here. So, going back to Ephesians 1, and at verse 15, we'll start there. Paul writing says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, uh, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. He's broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those also who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and whom you also are being built, uh, built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, I guess normally when you would hear somebody talk about, well, what does Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 mean? Well, they'd go right to those verses and start dissecting it immediately. I'm going to approach it a little bit different tonight, and I hope that um, here in a few minutes, once we've looked at some things, you'll understand why I'm doing it this way. But you'll notice that in what we've just read, there's obviously a lot of different things that are talked about there, and I'd like us to focus on a couple different items in particular. We had read about this concept of being seated in heavenly places. We saw that. Back in chapter 1 and verse 20 where it's talking about the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the power of God raised him up and made him to sit in the heavenly places. And then in chapter 2 and verse 6, it's using that same terminology, talking about our resurrection, spiritual resurrection out of the death of sin unto life in Christ. Now, when does that happen? When do we experience that spiritual resurrection? When we come up out of the water. That's right. We read about that back here in Romans chapter 6. Let's turn back there and look at a portion of this chapter here. Romans chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1 there and just read down through verse 11. So Paul asked the question there, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness 
of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, no longer dies, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves or consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's really no way to get around it. Uh, Paul makes it so very plain here in this passage. It's one of the reasons that we often go to Romans chapter 6 because it's so very plain and easy to understand. When we are baptized... It is a likeness of the death, burial, and then resurrection of Christ. When we see language like we saw there in Ephesians where it's talking about this spiritual resurrection out of death that takes place when we are obedient to Christ, it's talking about this process of being baptized and repenting of our sins. Now there's another thing that we saw as we were reading there in Ephesians we saw talked about the church, which the scriptures tell us, as we read, is the body of Christ. Talked about that there at the end of chapter 1. And uh, we actually saw it alluded to again as we read further into chapter 2, where it was talking about the Jew and the Gentile, how they were both put into one body, Right? And, of course, in chapter 4 and verse 4, another familiar verse where uh, Paul again reiterates the fact that there is but one body, there is but one church that Jesus died to establish. And it's for Jew and Gentile alike. It doesn't matter where you're from or who you are or who your parents were, etc. All can be part of this one unified body of which he is the head. Now, how does a person get added into the body of Christ? Well, I think we're going to see that it's the same answer as what we were just considering there with the concept of being resurrected, to be seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Let's come back to the book of Acts in chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. And we'll just start reading there in verse 37. You remember Peter was preaching this sermon to those there at Pentecost, the Jews who had assembled, and he was basically laying it out for them, explaining, look, you put the Son of God to death. And as they considered all that, and they considered the, the various evidence that he was putting forth and presenting to them to show the validity of his message, says that when they heard it, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How can we make this right? We've clearly made some bad choices here, to say the least. So Peter responds in verse 38. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. We see even here he's alluding to the fact that this is beyond just you as Jews. This is to all who are far off, even the Gentiles. Verse 40, it says, With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So in other words, they had something they needed to do. Right? He wouldn't say, you need to be saved, if they were already saved. Right? Obviously, he gives these instructions so that they would be saved. And so, verse 41, those who gladly received his word, in other words, those who favorably responded, what did they do? It says they were baptized, and there were about 3,000 souls added to them on that day. Now, in connection with that, jump down to verse 47, and notice, who is it that's actually adding these people 
to the body of believers, to the church. Notice it says the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So you put it all together. You look, look at all the language that's used here. Those that would save themselves from the perverse generation around them were those that responded to the instruction to repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And it says that when they did that, the Lord added them to the church. Got it? All right. Now, another thing that we saw there in the text, uh, especially there in chapter 2, uh, kind of highlighted verses 11 through 13, but really most of the rest of chapter 2, he, he talks about this concept of both the Jew and the Gentile alike being unified in Christ. But he uses some language there in uh, those verses in particular that is interesting and I think um, we, we need to look at here a little bit deeper. So he talks to them, the Gentiles that is, as those who were once referred to as the uncircumcision. And they were called that by who? By the circumcision. In other words, the Jews. And they were called that because of the physical circumcision that they had as followers of the covenant, the old covenant, the covenant of Moses. So what was the process that had brought these Gentiles, these uncircumcised individuals, to be now unified with those that were physically circumcised? Had they gone through physical circumcision? Well, no, we know that's not the case. You go read the book of Galatians, and that becomes pretty apparent. Uh, kind of towards the end of the book there, in chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul makes the point, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but faith that works through love, is what he says. And that's not the only place, of course, that he, he talks about that. Throughout the whole book, he makes that point. So it's not about physical circumcision. So what is it that had happened that had now unified these two distinct peoples? Well, it was something spiritual that had happened. Come with me over here to Colossians, chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians, chapter 2, we'll start in verse 11 there. Notice right away the language that we see. It says, In Christ you also were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. This isn't a physical thing now. He's saying this isn't something done with men's hands. But this is the, as he goes on, putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, what's that? What's the circumcision of Christ? It's obviously spiritual, but how does a person go through that? Well, keep reading. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him, having forgiven you all of your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's taken it out of the way. He's nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Huh. Are you noticing a trend? In each of the three concepts that we've looked at that Paul talks about in the surrounding context of the verses in particular that we're looking to try and define and make sure we understand properly, this idea of sitting with Christ in the heavenly places, this idea of being part of his church, his body, this idea of experiencing this spiritual circumcision, being unified, it's all made possible through the process of baptism. Scriptures clearly point, point that out. So, why would we notice that? 
Well, if we, if we notice that all these surrounding concepts in which right there in the middle are verses 8 and 9 talking about grace and it's not by works that you're saved, not works of merit. How could we rationally conclude that somehow we're saved apart from the process of repentance and baptism if it's basically saturating those first two chapters altogether? That would be foolish, wouldn't it? We are saved by grace. Amen to that. When you read that phrase, what we should think about is the fact that we did not and could not ever earn what Christ did for us. No matter how good you behave yourself, <laughs> you could never be good enough so as to be able to say to God, you know what, you owe me salvation. Nope. Now there's all kinds of places we could go, but for the sake of time I tried to boil this down to as few passages as we could get away with looking at that make the points that we want to make. So we're going to come over here to Romans 5 and we're going to read verses 6 through 11. There it says, when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. What wrath? Well, think about the day of judgment, in which we're all going to stand before the throne and have to answer for the lives we've led. Well, we know what the wages of sin is. Here in this same book, you go over the next chapter, verse 23, it tells us the wages of sin is death. So wrath awaits those who persist in their sins, but having been justified by the blood of Christ, we're now saved from that wrath. For if when we were enemies, verse 10, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having now been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You begin arguing that somehow you do indeed earn your salvation by doing something, then you miss something. You need to go back and read some more. And sometimes we might be accused of saying that, uh, but, but that's just simply not the truth. We are absolutely saved by God's grace and His mercy. Christ came because of that grace and that mercy. It was not our goodness or our perfection that merited our ability to have eternity with God. Now, a very important part of those verses is the phrase, through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. There's, there's more at play here than just God's mercy and outpouring of love. There's a response from us. It's not that we're, you know, earning anything, but nonetheless God expects that we react a certain way if we're going to accept the gift that he's trying to offer to us. James, in James 2 and verse 18, he makes the argument there. He kind of concludes the argument in verse 26 where he says, Faith without works is dead, just as the body without the spirit is dead. But jumping back to verse 18, he says, Well, somebody might say, Well, you have faith, but I have works. He says, Well, you show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll demonstrate it to you. You see, biblical faith, 
faith is more than just believing something. It's believing it to the extent that you're going to behave a certain way because of what you believe. So we say we have faith in God, then we better be behaving in such a way so as to demonstrate that we truly do believe in Him and, and trust in Him. Now maybe one of the best places we can go to show that faith or believing in Christ is more than just saying, yeah, I believe in Him, is back here to the example we have in Acts chapter 16. And we've looked at this recently, I'm aware, but we're going to look at it again. Acts chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 29. The Philippian jailer here was in charge of Paul and Silas and, of course, several other prisoners. And there's this earthquake that happens in the middle of the night. All the prisoners are loosed of their chains. The jailer apparently had fallen asleep, and he wakes up and kind of perceives what's happened, and he thinks, well, surely everybody's fled. I'm going to be put to death as a result. So he starts to go through the motions of taking his own life, and, of course, Paul stops him. And so verse 29 says he called for a light. So that, that tells us there that he was... He was in the dark. He could kind of perceive what had happened, but he really couldn't see where everybody was. He just assumed that they'd all ran away. So he calls for a light. Once he hears Paul say, you know, don't hurt yourself. So he runs in. He falls down, trembling before Paul and Silas. He says, uh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? There in verse 30. Verse 31, it tells us that Paul responds and says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So we could stop right there. Well, see, Paul just said to believe in Christ. Right? Well, what happened next? Verse 32, They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. Verse 33 says that he went and tended to their stripes, the, the wounds that had been afflicted, as punishment for their gospel preaching before they were thrown into the prison. And then after he'd done that, it says immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Huh. That's interesting. And when he brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, notice the language, having believed in God with all of his household. So the instruction is, believe in Jesus Christ. When did he accomplish that instruction? Well, it was after he had been baptized with the rest of his household. They'd heard the rest of the gospel message preached, and they responded to it just like everybody else we read about in the book of Acts. It's all consistent. So our obedience, our demonstration of faith, coupled with this gift that God is offering is what actually allows the whole thing to come to fruition. Again, not that we're earning anything by doing what God said, but we are accepting what he's offering us. Now, verse 10 of the text there in Ephesians 2 is, is interesting. It says there that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's interesting. And, and again, I think it, it bolsters what we're, what we're seeing here, this idea that God expects something of us. He's willing to offer us something that we don't deserve, that we didn't earn, but he does expect that we're going to change our behavior and do some things differently if we're going to be recipients of that gift. Because he created us for a particular purpose to walk in a particular way. And so it's basically saying, look, if you'll turn away from the thing which separated you from me to begin with, then my son has now paid this price which you've incurred, he's paid that penalty on your behalf, so now it's expected that you turn away from that which has separated you and now embrace what I put you on the earth for. 
to do good, to walk uprightly, to follow my commandments. I created you in Christ for good works. How will we glorify the Father in heaven? John 15, verse 8, Jesus gives us the answer. That you bear much fruit, he says. Do good. Be connected to the vine and produce. And Luke 17, 10 is so very important. Notice what Jesus said there. Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. Jesus says, Likewise you, when you've done all those things which you're commanded, you will say, We are unprofitable servants. We have simply done... I injected the word simply there, but it, the nature of the text, and it's inferred that that's the mentality here. We've done that which was our duty to do. We're all sinners. We don't deserve anything good from God, but we are surely going to do what is our duty to do in response to what he's offered us freely. Remember Paul worded it in Romans 12, the first couple of verses there. That, that's our reasonable service in light of all that's been done. Ask you this question. If God created us for good works, which clearly he did, we've just established that there in what we've read, why is it so difficult to imagine that obedience is somehow completely removed from the process of salvation. <laughs> Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Being obedient to God is not earning anything from Him. It's just simply acknowledging that He's created us to do certain things, to be a certain way. And because he's shown love towards us when we didn't deserve it, we should want to reciprocate that love towards him and simply do what he's asked us to do. So you got it? So next time somebody asks you about that passage, remember that you don't just have to talk about those verses there Talk about the whole context of what Paul's writing. And you can show, using all these different examples, look, it all points to the same place. It all points to the same process. All these different um, descriptions of the blessings that exist in Christ, uh, it all starts at the same place. It starts with hearing the gospel, believing it, Confessing Jesus as Lord and King, confessing Him as the very Son of God, acknowledging what He's done for us, in response to that, being willing to turn away from that which has separated us from God, to repent of our sins, to be buried with Him in baptism, which the Scriptures tell us is what cleanses us then of our past sins, so that we can then rise as He rose, to walk in newness of life, to now embrace the goodness that we were created to fulfill. I'll stop there. I feel like if I keep going, I'll just be repeating myself. So the lesson will be yours then. If there's anybody here tonight that needs to respond to the gospel or needs prayers in any way, we stand ready to assist you in those things. Our brother has chosen a song of invitation, and so as we sing that now, if anybody needs anything, please come up to the front.